Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm so bummed that I can't be there in person, but alas, after 2.5 years of uh, escaping COVID, uh, it finally got me. The BA5 strand is no joke, so please be careful and vigilant, everyone. My name is Cordell Carter, and I am the executive director of the Socrates program at the Aspen Institute, as well as the founding director of the project on belonging. Education and workforce are near and dear to my heart. Uh, I am a first generation college student in my family, and uh, I didn't have a whole lot of role models for the things that I want to do. Uh, so I had to go find them. And I found them uh, in K-12, teachers that took a liking to me. I found them on campuses across this country and this globe where professors saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. So this isn't just an academic exercise for me. This is personal. Uh, this is about liberation. This is about maximizing our utility as human beings. And so as uh, you think about the state of education, I like to start at the macroeconomic level. So let's do that, shall we? What is the space that we are in? And so the total population in America, in the United States of America is about between 332 million to 338 million. Um, you would say, hey, 6 million is a big uh, uh, range. Actually, it's not. You, we don't count every single class, I'm sorry, every single household in this country. Uh, we do statistical sampling. Um, you just estimate how many people are there based on a sample size. And the range, you know, for a country of this size of, of 6 million, 332 versus 338, uh, that, that's fairly, that's really, really good. Our Census Bureau is very good in this country. Um, but so what's in that? What's the age mix? And I think this is a very important point here to make. In 2020, about 18.3% of the U.S. population fell between the ages of, of zero and 14 years of age. 65% are in the 15 to 64 years of age group. Now, why is that important? That's important because that is your workforce. For the first time in American history, we have five generations in the workforce simultaneously. Um, the, the tail end of your very, very young boomers all the way to, um, I guess, very old uh, zennials. We're all in the workforce together, and it makes for a very interesting mix. Um, as one of my uh, podcast hosts say, you have to watch this space because there's a lot of movement happening. Now, the, 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 the tail end, if you will, about 16.6% .6 of the population is 65 and older. These are my parents. These are uh, what I would call the uh, the middle age boomers, if that's a term. Um, uh, my parents actually are still working. They're semi-retired. They retired in, in their, their uh, I would say, early 60s and were bored. And they went back to work um, as consultants. My mom's a nurse. My dad's a, a former military um, serviceman in uh, the Navy. And so he's back consulting on aircraft carrier safety like he did for 35 years before. So they're, they're semi-retired, traveling a lot, but they're still in the workforce. The largest group of adults um, are aged between 25 and 29. Um, I think I remember all of those years, my 20s. I'm no longer there. And it's a good even split between 11.8 uh, million men and 11.4 million women. Now, this is important because this is a group that's upskilling, reskilling. They're just really starting their way. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they will be on your college campuses, uh, applying for entry-level jobs. This is, this is the prime target here, if you will. So let's talk about the US labor force for a minute. Um, the labor force right now is about 154 million people. That's how many jobs are actually filled. We're expecting that to grow to 165.5 million by 2030. Um, the, by the last business day of, of May 22, there were 11.25 million job openings. Do you remember what I just said about the age, the adults between 28 and 29, how many there were? Um, there are about 23 million. Uh, this is the gap that they are seeking to fill. You know? So where are the biggest job openings in the country? Um, surprise, surprise, education and workforce. I'm sorry, education and health services has currently the largest job opening. So 2.12 million uh, job openings. Professional and business services. So think anywhere from consultancies 
uh, your, your big firms to some of your high-end uh, technical uh, providers. Uh, maybe think of your, your corporate IT department. Um, you have uh, 2.1 million open jobs. Trade, transport, utilities, which are huge in Tulsa. Almost 2 million job openings. Leisure and hospitality, which are big everywhere. Uh, 1.7 million job openings. Government, surprising, very secure jobs. A little over 1 million open jobs. And in manufacturing, almost 1 million open jobs. Now, this is going to be a really interesting trend, and I don't have time to go to it today, but we are starting to reshore manufacturing. We want to bring back uh, some of our supply chain issues. If, if there's one thing that we learned during COVID, uh, the height of COVID, I'm talking 2020 to early 20, I'm sorry, to late 2021, is that we don't run our own supply chains. If you have to depend on another country to provide your uh, medicines or, 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 or goods that are required right away, uh, we, we've done something called just-in-time uh, product delivery for the last 30 years. It, it makes people a lot of money, but you, you give up something. And what you give up uh, in exchange for that profit margin is control okay, and, and dependability. Because if, if I'm India and China and I too am suffering from COVID, that is one customer uh, delivery that will not get made. I'm not going to send medicine that my supply chain have created for you that you've paid for. I'd rather just pay the breach fee for the contract. Uh, I'm going to take care of my people first. And so for certain sectors, we have to really think about uh, reshoring and, and preparing people for those jobs. Now, let's talk about, I'm sorry, one more thing is unemployment. Very, very tightly labor market. I'll need to tell you all this. We only have 3.6% unemployment. And, and unemployment in this country basically means the people that are making decision to not actively seek work. I'm not talking about people that are disabled uh, or for whatever reason are unable to work. I'm talking about people that literally just decided um, I am not going to seek work. There is plenty of work to be had uh, by people who want it. And so there's something to consider. Very, very tight labor market. And you are basically being asked to fill the gap as quickly as humanly possible. And so I can imagine that some of you all are feeling the heat. Uh, now let's talk about the people that are your customers that are seeking higher education services. Uh, between the years of 2011 and 2021, approximately 38% of people aged 25 and older had completed a bachelor's degree or higher, okay? And so we are not talking about the entire, all of the age cohorts, we're just talking about the middle part. Um, those folks, if, if you remember, I talked about 65% of the population is between 15 and 64, where I'm not talking about 15 to 25 year olds, it's about 25 and older. Okay, so a smaller group, about 38% already have achieved a bachelor's degree. On average, the number of students that start post-secondary education plans every year is a little over 4 million people. The total number of students in higher ed right now at any, any level, be it two-year, uh, a certification program, you name it, uh, is about 14 million people. We're not talking about a lot of people. Uh, it's less than 10% uh, of the population uh, overall, because we know how big our numbers are. So of the people that are uh, getting into college or seeking college or have college, how many are actually graduating on time? Now, on time is not four years. Uh, statistically speaking, it's actually a six-year running average. And so we're looking at the cohort from uh, 2014 and looking at data ending in the year 2020. The overall six-year graduation rate for that, those first-time, full-time undergraduate students is 64%. Those numbers have improved pretty dramatically. When I first started getting into macroeconomic issues related to education uh, 12 years ago, the number was hovering around 52%. And there was a lot of consternation in Washington about the efficacy of higher ed. Um, for community colleges, it was about 23%. And so a, a lot of investment over the last decade has really changed the game. Um, speaking of community college, 35% of, of people that enter community colleges, the two-year institutions, are graduating within three years. That's the market we use uh, to look at uh, the folks that are going through. So that's up from 23% from a decade ago. And so, I'm sorry, let's just take a moment to celebrate that. Uh, I know people say, oh, it's not 100%. Well, nothing is 100%. Um, I like to celebrate the little things and improving more than 10% on for both higher ed uh, uh, institutions. I, mean, I think this is tremendous and we have a lot to celebrate. So please take a moment to do that.
Now, why are you doing that? I wonder you contemplate the last two years. They've perhaps been um, paradigm shifting for the higher ed industry. There's been a lot of folks that don't think that you all are going to last or you're going to look very, very different. So let's talk about the impact of, of COVID on higher ed. Uh, number one, this is pretty obvious, enrollment is down. Uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, this is a Doug Belkin's work. He covers the higher education beat for the Wall Street Journal. College enrollment uh, continued to decline, according to the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, um, compared to year over year. Undergraduate programs lost 465,000 300 students, or 3.1% of the total. Since the start of the pandemic, enrollment has declined by nearly 7%. Remember, I, we're not talking about a large pool of people. We're talking about 4 million people a year that start undergraduate education, okay? And to lose, uh, uh, what, 3% of that is, is, I think, very, very challenging. And 7% over the last two years is something to be concerned about. Now, what does this mean for campuses? It means cuts. Uh, if, unless you have a huge uh, endowment that is throwing off millions and millions of dollars to help you cover costs, uh, things are going to, to fall off. Uh, something has happened now that I, I never thought was possible. I'll get to it later. And, and that's, you know, this idea of, of lifetime employment for tenured em employees. Uh, it's just, uh, it's on the table now. I think there's some data I'll get to later that tells you specifically how many schools are contemplating it out loud. Uh, but think about major loss. You know, there are some programs that are good for society or good for the community, but are not financial winners. And so the university was covering at a loss because it was a good thing uh, for society. Well, in tough times, things have to be cut and tough decisions made. Um, and university presidents are really feeling the heat. Uh, I advise you to look at the number of retirements that have been announced just this year alone, 2022. Folks are tired, <laughs> they are stressed out. Uh, they've had to make some very, very challenging choices that you know heretofore have never really been a part of the conversation for higher ed, I would say at least in the last 50 years. And you're seeing the impact on these are much younger presidents that have at least another 20 year run in them are deciding that they're done. Um, so very, very challenging environment. In fact, if you look across the five largest undergraduate majors at four-year universities, um, liberal, for instance, liberal arts enrollment um, has fell the steepest at almost 8% across the board. I'm a humanities guy, this offends me. <laughs> so uh, I, I, some of my best classes were those very large lectures with, you know, um, I went to a public university, a uh, public land grant university for undergrad. And you know, some, it wasn't uncommon to have 1,200 people uh, three days a week in these giant lectures as we're all learning about psychology and history and the classics. Uh, so imagine some of those classes going away. These are, are so central to, to creating a classically educated adult. Um, and, and this brings a, a broader point. Let us not forget the role of the university. It's not just dollars and cents. Uh, I know that's important, but the role is, uh, a very important finishing school for, for humans. Uh, this is where the best among us go, um, not just to get a job, but to be a better version of ourselves, to actually be contributors to the greater whole, this thing we call society. It makes us more sustainable. The more information we know, when we get to meet people from all over the world at our, our campuses, this makes us just better human beings, uh, more capable of functioning in the 21st century world. And so uh, I would hope that that isn't being lost. Now, I, I mentioned uh, some of the financial dynamics of universities and enrollment is big. The other piece here that I, I have to emphasize is the decrease in enrollment for international students. Uh, I am sure um, Tulsa is, is, is not unlike any other uh, university town where there's a heavy dependence, um, especially at private universities, on international students. Why? They typically are paying double the triple the amount of tuition just for the right to be on campus. And so they are frankly subsidizing at the cost of education for everyone else on campus. Uh, higher education in America continues to be the envy of the world. Don't believe the hype. Uh, we haven't fallen that far this fast, trust me. People all over the world want access to our universities. 
Uh, but the fact that those numbers have fallen 43% since 2000 for um, international students is, is very troubling. I mean, this is a direct hit to the bottom line of so many universities. So that's how enrollment is, is, is causing some problems on campus. Now let's look at some of the other issues that what I call exacerbation of troubling trends. I'm talking about men. Young men are, well, for the last 50 years, men have been, have declining enrollment at universities. I went to Notre Dame for, for law school. And what I didn't know that until 1968, there were no women that attending Notre Dame. They had a women's college called St. Mary's that was across the street, still is by the way. Uh, and so it was shocking to me that these amazing women that I was seeing every day on campus were, you know, this is a 40 year old thing. They're, they're relatively new. Uh, it, it was shocking. I, I can't imagine a university that wasn't co-ed, um, but this is very much a case. But since then, since I would say the late, early 70s, uh, enrollment of men have been decreasing, uh, not precipitously in the last five years, precipitously. Um, in fact, at the close of the 2021 academic year, women made up 60% of college students, an all-time high, and men were just at 40 uh, now, I, I, I do believe that this is problematic uh, because men are approximately 49.5% uh, of the population. Uh, you, you, you need them to be as educated as everyone else. Uh, and I don't think it's sustainable. I don't have great answers here, um, but I, I have some, some ideas on how we can fix it. Uh, and it's going to be a little out of the box, but I'll get to it, okay? So some of the economic challenges I mentioned are, are forcing historic uh, changes in governance. Uh, for the last, what, 400 years, universities have been this shared enterprise, if you will. So, you know, economic decisions are, uh, and, and, and I should say strategic decisions are made at the highest level um, by your administrators, by your university presidents, but actually academic issues are actually shared, shared amongst the faculty senate, um, this is where the idea of tenure came from. I remember covering some of the first tenure cases uh, in law school. It was a real big issue during um, the first wave of free speech movements in the 60s as university professors were speaking out and some are being punished by the universities. And you know, the, basically our, our highest federal courts ruled that tenure is a property right. And you know, we can't do takings in this country without compensation. And so that's how tenure became such a big deal for university, frankly, the holy grail, if you will. Well, that holy grail is, is being tapped, okay? Um, economic decisions, when you close a major, uh, when you close a, an academic department, there are people attached to that, people that in some cases have been there for a long time. And so unfortunately, tenure is on the chopping block. Um, and I don't think even with a recovering um, enrollment that that's going to change. Uh, I think you're, you're seeing the beginning of the end of something that's been with us for a very long time, I would say multiple decades, uh, for a variety of reasons. Universities wanna be more flexible, and, and frankly, I think your students are demanding it. Um, try to explain lifetime employment to young people. Uh, they don't get it. I know I didn't as a younger person. Now I do. I'm not so young of a person in my house about to start college in a couple of years. I can't wait for her to sp speak to a, a tenured professor who could really care less about the politics of uh, the statements they're about to make that day. They, they need to understand what, what freedom of speech looks like in real life. Um, uh, so I, I'll withhold my personal opinion on that. I'm just coloring the forest for you, if you will. So it's not all doom and gloom. I know I, I've been kind of negative, but I, I just want to describe the environment that you're in. Uh, as I said, American universities are still the envy of the world. Um, it's one of our, our best assets and frankly, the best products of this dynamic uh, democratic republic we call the United States of America. Um, but I think our, our times, our current times, and, and frankly, our trends are telling us that we need something a little different from our 4,400 comprehensive universities. Um, students and parents have been real clear about what they want for universities. They want college decision makers to shake up their budgets and invest in new programs and technologies that will prepare them for careers, okay? So colleges must show that they are in touch with the real world not this esoteric place, but the actual real world, not an ivory tower, 
um, but a tower where you can learn to make ivory. Okay, that, that's the world that we're in. And so I, I think this lends itself to promising trends. I, I mentioned some of the labor issues that we're facing and, and what I should say about a job vacancy. It's not just about an open job and people that are actually employed have to work more. That's part of it. It's also lost economic activity, okay? Uh, um, I, I started my career with IBM. At any given moment, even at the height of the, the, the 2000s where you know, everyone was being hired and we were all getting multiple offers coming out of graduate programs, um, there were still open jobs by the droves. And, and that open job meant that there is somebody that won't buy a house, there's someone that won't buy a car, there's someone who won't send their, their kid to college, there's somebody that won't get married, there, there's somebody who won't generate economic activity because that job is open. Now, never mind that we're able to get the job done. That's not the point. The point is we're all here to maximize our economic utility and higher education, frankly, is the accelerator of that, which lends itself to, I think, uh, some very interesting possibilities as we think about uh, the future. One, here's a promising trend that actually comes from K-12. And it's this idea of flipping the classroom. Um, since the time of Alexandria, when you had to travel to, to ancient Egypt, to hear the knowledge given to you by these professors, to actually see books that were bound. They were a Coptic uh, language at the time. Um, you had to travel there. Now knowledge is in your hand. Uh, my, my iPhone 13 is, is more powerful than the first versions of the mainframes that IBM created in the 40s. I mean, just think about it. these mainframes used to be an entire room, probably bigger than my house here. Uh, but I have that in my, my pocket. Moreover, my daughter has it in her pocket, um, always attached to her hand at 24 hours a day. <laughs> I pry it from her when she sleeps. <laughs> but, and so, so now that you're walking around with knowledge, what does that mean to the knowledge holders? Okay, I'm a, I'm a fan of libraries. I actually pick my undergraduate institution based on the size of its library holdings. That's how old I am. Um, and Susan Library at the time was in the top 10 of the universities uh, in the world in terms of volumes held. Um, now it's like a mausoleum. It's a place where you go and study and look at beautiful things. And frankly, when I was just there recently doing a lecture, folks are just having Instagram photo shoots, uh, looking like they were studying. Nobody was actually studying, uh, but the, 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 the libraries don't hold uh, the importance that they used to, uh, nor do the, the people uh, in the universities, the roles have to change. Your job as a professor, your job as an administrator, frankly, is to be a coach, a, a coach, because you still have more information than folks because you've actually had jobs, you've gone through university. And so when I say flipping the classroom, we're flipping the paradigm on the model where the students are coming to you for knowledge. No, knowledge is accessible, it's self-evident, if you will, it's everywhere. They're coming to you for advice. They're coming for you for curation of their educational experience. That's a very different job than saying I'm the psychology professor and I'm gonna teach you the DSM manual. Very, very different, okay? Uh, digital. Um, I have a colleague, uh, the former colleague, we were at Gates Foundation together. I just ran into him in Aspen and I asked him what he was up to. And he told me he just raised a billion dollars, one with a B, a billion dollars to buy every single best practices laden digital education provider he can get his hands on. Okay, so the funders know where education is going. The question is, do we, all right? So imagine your university uh, that has, let's say 20,000 seats, able to expand by X5, maybe, maybe even 10X, because you are now offering hybrid uh, learning opportunities or completely digital uh, learning opportunities, uh, but they will leave with a degree um, from your university. That is where education is going. And those that are able to use best practices with respects to, to learning and teaching um, and, and translate that to the digital world are going to win. I'll give you another example. I was uh, hosting a conference in Puerto Rico in February and the owner of an NFL team was one of the speakers. I, I won't name them out of respect. Um, so I was asking this owner on the panel uh, what he was most excited about. I was expecting him to say the draft. What he said was the metaverse. 
And so I cocked my head like my beagle does when I make a weird noise. I said, please tell me more. The metaverse, what does that have to do with, with the NFL? He says, well, my seating capacity in the stadium is 75,000. Uh, my club seats have a very, they have a cap. Everything is capped in the real life, but I'm responsible for generating revenue. They know what the revenue is for the cap seating in the stadium. They know what it is for merchandise. We have historical trend date on that. But the metaverse allows me to play the game again with unlimited seats. So I can literally give you a game day experience from the comfort of your home with hundreds of thousands of other fans from around the world and you pay a fee for it. A small fee, but you're gonna pay a fee for that. And we get the revenue in real life. What does that look like in higher ed? Seems like you have some really bright students that will help you figure that out. And the first university that figures that out, the first community college that figures that out is gonna do very, very well. Um, one of the leading institutions in this regard is Arizona State. Uh, as you all know, um, uh, they, they do tremendous work with, with respect to access. And so please consider that this is this really promising trend um, with metaverse, all things digital, uh, as you are looking to, to, to deliver education services to a, a customer that's changing very quickly. And one of the, 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 the third, I should say, I don't want to say last, but the third uh, trend that I think is promising, and that is a greater embrace of alternative credentialing. I was born in the late 70s. Um, in my world, if I didn't go to college, my life was going to be subpar. And so from the age of five years old, even though neither of my parents and no one in my family had matriculated at the university, the only thing I heard was you're going to college, you're going to college, you're going to college, you're going to college, or your life will not be great and we will be very disappointed. So there was really no options for myself and my younger sisters. We were going to college, okay? In fact, when my older sister uh, decided that she didn't wanna to go to college and join the military, it was a, a national mourning in my house, okay? I was like, the military is gonna help her. She's got the GI Bill now, okay? She's, gonna, she's doing this for me because she all had the day. This is great. Um, and she did finish, by the way. So anyhow, um, now we are embracing something different. Remember what I said people were asking for the universities? They want the outcome. The input isn't nearly as important. And if you didn't know that to be true, please consider the number of lawsuits against some of our elite public and private universities that are happening right now that continue to charge regular tuition when the young people could not come to campus. And the big question for the courts is, what is the value of the brand? And what is the value of the residential experience? Okay? And so if people are wanting an outcome, you'll find them more embraceive of alternate ways to get there. And here's where I get very excited. This idea that our alternative credentialing is the way to go. I'm involved with a lot of initiatives there um, outside of Aspen. I'm super excited about that stuff because this is how we can reimagine the role of the university. Here's the thing, for the last hundred years, we have funded these beautiful things known as university campuses. There's infrastructure in addition to the physical plant. There's all these humans that are, uh, have the right set of values. Uh, they're all about the young people on that campus. So you can imagine reimagining the university campus as the premier incubator of talent. Now notice, I didn't say degree granting institution. I, I didn't say even the producer of the smartest people in the world. I'm saying that the producer, uh, the, the incubator for talent. So imagine giving a student five different pathways to get to what they want. One is a degree, one is some courses, plus uh, perhaps a little bit of seed funding for an entrepreneurial venture. One is a, uh, a degree plus, perhaps uh, with a Salesforce certification or cybersecurity uh, academy certification that they would have to pay extra for so the university is getting more revenue. Um, there are a variety of ways that the university can be the hub for talent development. And I encourage everyone to embrace this. Why? Because the puck is going that way with or without you, okay? People are demanding more. This, this $1.7 trillion of indebtedness from student loans is becoming a national political issue. Right now, the conversation is about 
debt forgiveness. But the question is going to switch at some point to why do we even go there? Why could, how could we allow this to happen? All of these adults that are feeling that they're underemployed, that they didn't make the best decisions uh, with their majors. Um, at some point, they're going to blame you. We know how this works, ladies and gentlemen, okay? And so my strong advice is to use the brain power that is on campus already to imagine a future. And more importantly, let the young people help you design this new place, the university of the future. Uh, and one of the advantages of, of Tulsa here, of 74008, is that you all have great relationships. Your university presidents talk to community college presidents. Everyone else talks to industry. Industry is talking to philanthropy. Philanthropy talks to the community. That is not common in a lot of places. I live in Washington, DC, okay? We, we, we talk in terms of Bs and Ts, billions and trillions, okay? But do we talk to each other across the aisle? Do we talk to each other across industry, across sectors? No, not at all, okay? All the conversations are happening externally. You, you, you have it in your little group and you go out to the groups that are similar to you outside of DC. That's how conversations work. I can't imagine what a powerful statement we would be able to make in the DC metro area, which is about 5 million people in the tri-state area. If we could have conversations between uh, employers and universities of the type that you already have resident in Tulsa, it's a, it's a part of the mix there. And so in conclusion, I'm just encouraging you all to leverage what you have. Call it the, the Luther Vandross strategy. Love the one you with. You don't need a new model. Just enhance the model that you have. You already are communicating. You're already articulating future needs. Uh, I know, for, for instance, what's happening with the Cybersecurity Academy with Tulsa Community College uh, and a couple other uh, organizations externally, uh, and then OneGAS, uh, looking to employ these, these people that are uh, being minted as cybersecurity professionals. That's happening in your town. So expand that model and models similar to it across all sectors. And all of a sudden, you're solving your own problems. And people are seeing you as this beacon, saying this is the place where I can go and maximize my economic utility. And they see a lot of partners at the table, be it a community college, be it University of Tulsa, you name it. But more importantly, you're getting the outcomes that everyone said they want. So I encourage you all to continue doing what you're doing. And I wish you the very best. And thank you again for having um, Sir Cooties, as I call myself, speak to you today. Thank you. Wow, Cordell, that was really awesome. Um, I really love um, all the trends, all of the, all of the knowledge and oh my gosh, you had my mind like really uh, just spinning about the possibilities of what of what we can do. It also, gosh, it really excites me because a lot of what you're talking about, we are doing, we're preparing, we're getting yes. ready. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I am really, really inspired today that we are headed in the right direction. Um, you know, it's one thing to think it, it's another thing to have a world renowned person such as yourself who has been in this place such a long time come and you know, tell us, yes, you're doing the right things, you're, you're headed in the right direction. So micro-credentialing, um, working together from uh, public training um, organizations to our higher ed, to our tech centers. I mean, it's just, we are, we are working hard to, to make sure that we have the next here in the Tulsa region. So I appreciate you, sir. Um, I thank you. I hate that you're not here. But yeah, I know that we've got a rain check, right? We're going to have to. Uh, Absolutely. And one thing I'll say, Rue, is uh, I, there is a, a spirit of humility that I, I love about Tulsa. But the country needs you all to be a little more boastful, not for your own purposes, but just frankly, so that more people could better understand how you do what you do. And so if there's any way of, of, of uh, uh, replicating the spirit of Tulsa and this, this spirit of collaboration and uh, frankly, the boldness to just go call the next person and say, listen, we need to work together for the greater good. That is what this country needs. And so uh, uh, I would strongly encourage you all to just uh, blow the horn a little louder 
All right. I yes. love that directive. Guys, do you hear him? We need to shout a little louder about what we're yes. doing. Also. Yes. Apparently we're pretty special. Now we know we're special, but it's great for um, other folks to recognize that too. So yes. I thank you so much, sir. Um, we are uh, we are better from hearing from you today. And I appreciate your time and your passion um, and your energy and your engagement uh, in this work. So I appreciate you and we will- Thank you. Uh, we will wrap. Yes, thank you so much.